Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's a bit unfair, actually. Uh, Jamie asked me to speak about something totally different. And I said, no, I'm grappling with this issue. And um, this has been on my mind for about a year and a half. And over the last two or three months, I said, I've got to at least come up with something that I'm satisfied with, not that this necessarily this is the answer, because I don't know anyone else who's dealing with this, and it kind of drives me a bit crazy. Um, not the, let, let me just uh, two minutes on, on generally what I'm trying to do, not what I'm going to talk about here. Um, I was at a conference, uh, I seem to live at conferences, um, a good number of years ago, and they had a research for the St. Louis Fed. The St. Louis Fed is kind of like the research fed within the federal system. So this was the director of research of the director of the research bank of the Fed system uh, was, was speaking. And um, and I hate to tell you this, I have, no, I have no idea what he was talking about because I don't remember. It wasn't important, at least I didn't think so. However, the reason I mentioned this, what I, which I have not forgotten, is in the middle of this talk, suddenly he went, people don't usually do that. And he said, you know what? There's a completely different way of running this whole monetary system. The problem is there is no jurisdiction anywhere that's currently doing it. I go, bingo. So you know, I'm not talk to him and all this kind of stuff. So my goal, and well, even before then, but ever since then, is to I was going to use the word create, that's wrong. To work within a small jurisdiction, and that's why I was so involved with Switzerland. Uh, where we can actually do this, All right. uh, to create a model <clears throat> that is functional, that is bigger than Guernsey, which has been doing it for 200 years, uh, but you know that doesn't count. Population of 56 and a half. There's a pregnant woman now. I heard so. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. That was bad. <laughs> All right. This has bothered me, and. Um, So I wanted to finally, finally start working on this. So I want to look at uh, basically three things and I'll give you some time for questions. So why, why in the world, why has this bothered me? Why do we need this? Number two, uh, what do we do? How, we do? how do we democratize money growth? That's really what I want to talk about, okay? Uh, and then let's look at a base analysis as to what this really means. So why is this needed? Um, people, good friends of mine who are involved in this, say, well, well it's, you know, it's the data. And, uh, and of course, that's what the Fed always says. So, so uh, are you going to increase the interest rate? Well, it, it's data determined, really. That, that was uh, Janet's favorite word. Well, of course it is. Really? I, I really don't believe that. Um, it, it is often, and they, they do a fairly good job of trying to do that. But the answer is no. I really don't believe it. Number one, uh, the, the Fed predictions, if you go back over the last 20 years, they've been horribly inaccurate. Okay, horribly inaccurate. Um, they are the largest employer of PhD economists in this country, and they cannot predict what's going to happen next. All right. So uh, why in the world should we therefore trust? Let's say, you know, Fisher talked about a monetary commission, which is different from. I'm just going to use Fisher's words here, uh, which is different from the commission that we talked about earlier. A monetary commission who determines the money growth, which is what this is all about. And I'm, I'm saying, well, in the US, that will most likely be the FYC, the Federal Open Market Committee, right? So we're going to leave the most important decisions in our economy up to 12 people. We don't really do that right now. That's the beauty of the current system, much as we disagree about it. Um, it. Normally, they use interest rates. So today, we have a combination of interest and macro uh, prudential uh, policies, right? Uh, I'm not going to go into either one of those. But the, the we, we use, we use interest rates and macroprudential in order to control our economy so that 320 million people, the approximate uh, population of our country, um, then decides whether they want to borrow money or not, right? Because it's a debt-based system that we have. So the whole thing is based on our willingness to borrow and the bank's willingness to lend, which is manipulated by the FOMC. So if we were to switch over to the sharing system, sovereign money, whatever you want to call it, um, then the assumption is, and I make that assumption, it would most likely be the F1C. So we're talking 12 human beings that are now going to make this decision. Whereas currently, that is an indirect decision. As you know, it takes up to about two years for their policy changes to actually move through the economy because 320 million people make decisions based on what it is that they have done. Are you all following me, right? Yeah. Now, what we're talking about with the sovereign money system or the sharing system, now we get the same 12 people. Except 
The decisions they make are direct. The current decisions are indirect. And you know what? I don't like that. I really have trouble with that. And I have more, when I speak at conferences, I have more people arguing with me about this one point than anything else. People say, you know what, I like this, this sounds really good, I like this, sounds really good. I have real problems with a small cadre of, of elites that are now going to make all of our decisions. And I don't have an answer. I did not have an answer. I'm, I'm going to give you an answer. Is my answer correct? No, but at least here's an answer. Uh, can we argue about it? Yes, absolutely. That's what this is all about. All right. So you're the first person, people who've, who've heard this, and I gave myself a deadline in order to do this. That's number one. Number two, political interference. There is terrible political interference. We have Nixon and Arthur Burns. We have today, this is historical fact, because Nixon was smart enough, dumb enough, to record every word that he said in the White House. Okay? So we have the direct conversations between him and Arthur Burns, where um, Nixon pushed Burns to manipulate the, the whole economic system of this country and half the world that's dependent on this to make sure that Nixon gets reelected. Okay? We have hard words. And by the way, there's a new um, paper that just came out on this, and um, just, just recently. And I, the actual transcript of the tapes are now available. It took approximately 20 years to correct that. Okay? It took a Falker who, who raised interest rates to 20% to correct what one man, Nixon, decided another man needs to do Burns, who did it. Okay? So really, this is all data dependent. And so we who are sitting here, who are in favor of a sovereign money system, are now going to create a system whereby a group of 12 people are going to directly control all this. And are we really that naive to think this isn't going to happen again? Please. I hope not. So that's what the purpose of this talk is all about. By the way, um, and, then, and then Falker said exactly the same thing. He was horrified that he was directly told by James Baker, quote, this is, this is a word-for-word -word quote, out of a um, interview that's like a week old. This is like right now, okay? The president is ordering you, not asking you, ordering you not to raise interest rates before the election. All right? By the way, it's the same with the ECB. Uh, the ECB under Draghi and, and before they do you use direct the purchase of uh, sovereign bonds in particular countries through the banking system to force those countries into particular portions of the treaties that were being formed and, and the, on, the ongoing participation in Europe. This isn't an American problem. This is a global problem. Okay, I mean, aside from Zimbabwe or whatever we want to mention, where there, there isn't even a hint of independence of <laughs> running our monetary system. And so I, I, I find it very strange. I talked to uh, my good friend, Michael Kumov, who's a good friend. I, I talked to him about this about a, about a year and a half ago, and he goes, well, well you know, it's all data. Anyway, you already know what I think about that, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, so that's why I think this is important. Now you know why. Uh, so I want to deal with uh, two things. Uh, under, the, under the democratization, remember, that's the kind of what I want to deal with. I want to deal with prediction markets and beauty contests, because this, I think, is, is one of the answers that I've come up with. All right? So let's look at prediction markets, first of all. How many, how many of you are aware of prediction? Like, I just want to know, okay, most of you are not great, some of you are, that's wonderful. Uh, prediction markets um, are, are basically a, um, a computer-driven system, and the nice thing today, we can get into software very, very simply, that has been proven to be incredibly accurate, much more accurate in the decisions that they come up with than the technical elites that, in theory, know what the decisions ought to have been. In other words, there's a crowd wisdom that, when it is structured correctly, really, really works. Okay? And there are now a lot of um, academic papers on prediction markets, has really developed only in the last decade or so, where they have tested different aspects, seen when it has worked, when it has not worked, deliberately sort of manipulated parts of it to see what the effects would be. And these are the things that they've come up with. Prediction markets work under these three scenarios. If you can fulfill these three conditions, prediction markets really work. You have to have a broad participation. So of the uh, group of people, and that can be a company, um, 
I was just talking to one of the top guys in GE, for instance. So, so here's an example. Uh, there are two companies right now that are bringing out uh, private uh, supersonic jets. Okay, so they need special engines. And so uh, it's Boom and uh, Surin, or whatever, the, the other company. And um, so should GE produce a new jet that will work uh, under supersonic conditions, Mach 1.5, uh, here's the, the foot-pounds output, here's the flow rate, etc. here's the temperature characteristics. And what you do is you run a prediction market. We don't get everybody involved. You get everybody involved that works in the engine development in GE, right? And then you want to have a broad participation. I'm going to talk to you about that just a bit and how to do that. The second thing is a risk and incentives. Okay, we're going to get back to broad participation, don't worry. Um, there has to be risk involved in the participants. Otherwise, people back to GE, uh, well, of course I'm in favor of that. I'm in the engine division. Hey, I want to make more money. So the answer is yes, categorically. Oh, no, no, no. You have to put up money <laughs> in order to participate in this prediction market for GE. Number one, you have to be a, a member of the engine division. So there's a limitation. But number two, we want to get everybody involved as much as possible. Okay. So what we do is we incentivize. Guess what? Um, if you come up with this, and I'm going to run you through as to how, to how to test that within the concept that we're talking about, then you, you can make some good money. We're going to end up, the incentive, you're going to end up making several thousand dollars if your answer is correct within the spectrum of what we'll end up doing. The risk is, though, it's going to cost you 10 bucks to enter, or 100, or you know, whatever, or most of the political ones. Let's not get in there, get some new details. All right? And no collusion. In other words, if people cannot talk among themselves, you have to have as much as possible create a system where people do not collude to come up with a single answer which then makes them win, which then gives them a lot of money. Okay, th those are the three characteristics, all right? Um, so let's talk about broad participation with what we're talking about. So I'm away from GE now um, in, in what we're doing. Uh, let's have a complete online explanation of both how, how these prediction markets work and also a beauty contest, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. And so we explain it to people who want to participate. We have an online program. I'm going to give you a baseline formula in, in just a minute, in just a half an hour, sorry. And uh, um, so, so what we do is we'll even create a program that solves that equation for you with what you think the truth is. For me. Okay, so it makes it as as easy as possible for as many people as possible to participate. And we do a big media campaign. Guess what? Our money system for in the future is going to be run through a prediction market instead of the FOMC. So Paul and Lily and Joe okay, and Jamie, we're not going to run it, along with every one of you because I don't know all your names. Yeah. All right? It's your choice as to whether you want to participate or not. Okay, what are the risks? Um, let me, let me run through some, some uh, quick numbers here as to where, where in the world I get these numbers from. Uh, the US, I'm going to use U.S. numbers in spite of the fact that I do not believe this will be initiated in the U.S., but we, the U.S. numbers are very easy. Most of us are familiar with them. So we have about a $20 trillion economy, right? Over the long term, let's say that we grow 2% per year, okay? Let's say, let's say that we... Um, then need to create the money for price stability that is equivalent to that 2%. Right? And um, let's, say, let's say that we run this once a quarter. So, uh, so we would have 500 million per quarter, approximately. I, I'm, I'm just giving you round numbers to show you where my numbers come from. Okay, 500 billion, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, be, I'll show you where the million comes from right away. Okay. Um, and within that system, then we need some money in order to run this market. Okay. So what I'm suggesting, within a $20 trillion economy, $500 million per term is not a lot of money. Okay. It is approximately half of 1% of the money growth that we would need. Okay. Um, the point of what we're trying to do what, what, what we are trying to do here, not what I'm trying to do, is to distribute that money as equitably as possible. 
however we want to do that. Okay, that's not the point of what I'm talking about, but that, I think that's, that's one of our goals, right? So, um, you know, we can talk about doing some of it through the federal government or through the state government or sending checks out to individuals. I, I'm not arguing with one or the other of that. But this money would be s to run this contest, this prediction market. And so therefore, it would not be distributed on an equitable basis. I'm so sorry, but it's only half of 1%. It's going to be distributed to the winners. I'll show you that right away. So that's the incentive. The risk is it's going to cost you um, $1,000 per share. So if we have $500 million available and there's $1,000 per share, so we have a maximum total possible of 500,000 shares that, that could be sold. It's strictly on a voluntary basis. If you want to, it's like investing in a company, except you reinvest every quarter. And you learn afterwards, after a while, how to do that. Okay? The return of the loss is coming. Here's the incentivization that I am suggesting. Okay, so a prediction market comes out to a certain value. And I'm gonna, the, the, the problem is this whole discussion is a bit circular because I give you details and I try to create a circle and then I give you more details and try to increase the circle. So hang with me for just a little bit longer, okay? So if you are at the top, so if your deviation from what the prediction market will end up predicting, is zero, you end up getting 40% of that $500 million. I think that's pretty good incentive. Would you be incentivized for that? But it would be divided among all the shares that would be within 2.5%. So this is 5%. So from 2.5 minus to 2.5 plus, we distribute 40% of the, of the $500 million. Okay? And down next is you're off by 5%, you get 15%. You're up by 10%, you get 10%, you got up by 15%, the total adds up to 100%. I'm going to get back to this slide because I probably lost some of you on that. that that's, hang on, just, just stay, stay with me here. All right, let's look at beauty contests. So that's what I'm calling democratization number two. First was prediction markets, now the beauty contest. What in the world is a beauty contest? Uh, Keynes brought this up um, in the 1930s. Uh, we talked about the stock market and decision-making process. What I'm suggesting is the same here. Beauty contest, uh, basically, it's the derivative of the choice. And, and, it, and it goes like this. Um, let's, say, let's say that you have um, 50, 50 photos of faces, okay? And you want to pick the most beautiful face. That's not a beauty contest. Kane's the way he decided the beauty contest. It's not what you think is the most beautiful face but what you think everybody else thinks is the most beautiful place. It's the derivative of the choice. That's the first derivative. And then, of course, you can go back and you say, well, no, other people think the opposite, so we end up doing the second derivative. But the whole point is not to decide what it is that you think, but to decide what it is that you think everybody else thinks. So let's go back to our money system. So we're going to run a, a prediction market, and a hedge fund in, on Wall Street is going to put up um, $20 million on a certain vote as to what they think should be happening in the American economy. But the point with the beauty contest is the hedge fund, it's not what they think. They have to now think what everybody else thinks. So well, what does the farmer in, the, in Appalachia think? They might not put up nearly as much money, but somebody in you know, St. Louis, what are they going to put up? So, there's actually been tests that have been run on this beauty contest concept, and people significantly alter their choices as a result of it. it this really works. Okay. So we have economic studies on that, and we have economic studies on prediction markets. So it's the derivative of the choice which changes what it is that you think. And trading would keep on going while this is happening. What does that do? Well, the initial distribution is going to look probably something like this. So here, zero is what I'm saying ultimately will be the choice. Okay, so initially you've got a low distribution of people making choices. People aren't stupid. Okay, and then uh, what in the world starts happening is we keep on running this. Okay. And ultimately, before the end of the quarter, 
we end up with something like this. So you get a, a clear point of answer as to what the money growth determination needs to be. And that is what's done. So what you're saying is that the beauty contest is over the question, what do most people think the money growth should have been for this quarter? Correct. Absolutely. And I'll help you a little bit as to how to make that decision. But that's the beauty contest. And the software to run this is easily available. I've got two, two companies right now that will provide it. No problem. And it's not, it's, not a, it's not a big lot of money. All right. Back to incentives. Now this makes maybe a little bit more sense to you now. You saw the chart previously. So the people that hit this thing bang on, they're, they're going to make a lot of money. Okay. Or depending on how much they put in, but they could easily make more. Now during that process, let's say you put $10,000 into a certain choice. And, and uh, so that's, that's 10 shares of $1,000 a piece, right? And, you, and as the, you know, several weeks go along, you go, ah, oh, I screwed up. So you sell. So instead of getting your $10,000 back, you might only get $6,000. Or you then purchase shares later on. I want to see what happens for a while. So, so one of my points is, is you, you stop the trading at a, sh at a short time beforehand. So, and, and you stop the purchase of new shares, and then you keep on allowing trading for a while. Can I yeah, yeah. restate your proposition? Yes. You have a beauty contest that determines what the answer is, and at the same time, you have this uh, payout yes. that is associated with the results of the beauty contest. Correct. But at the end, because everything is going on simultaneously, all the trading is going to be, as you say, at one point, and you won't have anybody trade. You won't pay anything off at the sides, it seems to me. No, because um, people aren't stupid. The people that are close are, not, are going to stop selling. And the people that are far out, nobody's going to want to buy their stuff. Oh, so, so the, fi okay. so the, fi the final prices would be correspond to the shape. Right? Exactly. Right. That's right. No, exactly. <laughs> you got it. All right. So I'm just calling this uh, Ben, you know, prediction market and beauty contest. Nice, nice, nice words. All right. Let's. Um, so this is what I went through. Why is this needed? I just showed you the method of democratization. So how do we get everybody involved? So let's look at a base case, base analysis, okay? And basically, what's happening, the amount of money increase, the amount of money growth determination, is basically depending on the, the, the delta, or the, you know, the change, change in velocity, delta GDP, and delta international reserves. Those are the three factors, right? And that's, that's what determines what the world, the, the number of dollars that we need in the system. Okay, um, what I'm using here is uh, the underlying conditions uh, that, that I haven't talked about is we've got a, a sovereign money system, so that will do all we keep on talking about, and we're using Kotlikoff's limited purpose banking. Okay, otherwise, there the, the, the are changes within what it is that, that I'm discussing uh, if that's not the case. If you're not familiar with limited purpose banking, you can ask me about it later. I'm happy to talk about it. It's basically the, the uh, mutualization of the uh, investment side of the bank and uh, the, the deposit side is a trust system. So it totally fits in with what it is that we're talking about. That's one of the reasons why Kotlikoff works together with us, because his, he is more interested in limited purpose banking. We are not, as, that's not what we stress. We, I mean, us here, we stress sovereign money, Fisherian structures, and the banks can be run in a number of different ways. For instance, in Switzerland, they even, whatever, I pushed the cut by that time, they'd already created the, um, the, the verbiage in the, con the new constitutional change. But it, it totally works together. I, I just want to say that's how, I, that's how I built this and what it is that you'll be about to see. So how do we change this? So remember, I was saying we've got delta velocity, delta GDP, and delta international reserves. Um, Del so I, I don't know how good your math is, so I'm going to walk you through this just a little bit slowly. So I don't want you to uh, totally have steam come out of your ears. It's very simple velocity and, and the same kind of structure I'm using. I just want to go through this. So VT, that's velocity today. So that will be per quarter. I'm just suggesting quarter. It doesn't have to be quarters. I'm just suggesting that. So VT minus 1 is a previous quarter. That's really all that's to it. Okay. And, and we want a fraction, so this creates a fraction where, where uh, the denominator is last, is the last quarter. 
So what is the increase over the last quarter? It's very simple. Let's say velocity, I'm just using crazy numbers here. Let's say velocity today is 11. Velocity last quarter, I mean, it's not, you know, that's a crazy number, but that's my point. It's nice, simple. And velocity last time was 10. So 11 minus 10 is 1. Over 10 is 10%. So we've had a 10% increase of velocity. That's, that's really all this little formula does. Okay. Um, the next one, so, so basically if you look at GDP, GDP e essentially equals workers times productivity, and workers equals working age population from FRED, you know, the St. Louis FED, I don't know if you, you can get almost everything on FRED, just phenomenal. So uh, they use 15 to 64, I can never what happens, I don't know what happens at 65, I guess people don't work that anymore. Um, so the working age population, so W, what I'm defining is working age from FRED, times the participation rate, so it goes up and down, times one minus unemployment rate, right? Because we, we do have an unemployment rate, we do have a participation rate, which finally, suddenly, is, finally is going up a bit. It's been going down for the last 20 years, roughly. It's terrible. So, same thing, we want a, um, we want a fraction. So this looks exactly like the velocity, that's why I showed you that one first. It's exactly the same, it's a fraction. And productivity is the same. Now, productivity, is not directly measured, as uh, I think Mark said earlier. So, so what you need to do when you work this through and you want to be part of the prediction market and make a bunch of money off this, you need to guess this. Because uh, we would always publish productivity from the last quarter, and we would publish W from the last quarter, and we would publish velocity from the last quarter, so everybody starts off equally. Okay? And what do you think's changed? Okay? That's, that's really what this is all about. So here, here's the factors. If you took the, took, take the, so when we talk about money quantity, so delta is a change, right? So what's, what's the quantity that we really need? We need to look at the total funds in the bank depository window. Remember, this is Kolokov, okay? Total funds had in, in the investment window. The investment window is, is the money that we're actually, you know, that we're using for mortgages, for means, whatever it is, whatever it is. And then currency and circulation outside of the banks. Money market funds, maybe. I'm not sure those would exist under Kolokov. Okay, there's a high probability they would not. Doesn't really matter. I threw it in. We can argue about it. Doesn't really matter. And K is the expert factor. You're going to see this right away. This, this becomes really, really important. Then I simply, just to make things easier in the formula that you're about to see right away, so I just called M is total aggregates. So it equals what normally what we three think of as M3, that's A plus B plus C plus R, which we often don't see very much, which is international reserves. And the formula I'm about to show you, there's a change of reserves because within the Fisherian, within sovereign money, if all of a sudden a trillion goes off to China, what does that do to us here? And I don't, I don't hear anybody talking about this. I don't understand because it's all data driven, except of course I don't believe it is. So <laughs> we, we've got through that, all right? So uh, are you ready? All right, here, there we go. that's what it looks like. And I gave you the factors again, so you probably don't remember them. It's, it's, it looks terrible. Please stick with me here. So this simply says the change in workers times all the money that we have. Well, that's a factor. right? Then we have uh, how much money internationally is sitting there as central bank reserves. What's the change? Has it gone up or has it gone down? Right? It's going to be part of it. And then we take the change in velocity. Now this time I'm not using R. There's no velocity in R. R doesn't go anywhere. Reserves. Reserves sit there. China has, well they're down now, they're down. You, you know that. You know the Chinese ownership of treasury is substantially lower. The largest sovereign, the largest owner in the world, I believe, is Japan now. Right? I think I think I got that right. So there are no, there's no velocity. So whatever China has of our money either in treasuries or cash, it's all treasuries, they're not stupid. Uh, it's not going anywhere, it's just sitting there, right? So there's no velocity. Okay, so, so R is not included, it's not part of that. And then uh, the change in productivity, and uh, there is no productivity with reserves. It just sits there, does absolutely nothing. So I'm saying, this is a base case, so, the com so we, we create an open computer program, you enter whatever these factors that you think are relevant, you enter it, and then you get a certain number over here that, that said, this is how much money we should stick into the American economy this quarter. Ah, but then there's this expert factor. 
Actually, I don't think that's what it is. See, we have a trade bar with China, and so in actual fact, what we should do is we should subtract 50 billion off this answer. Um, on the other hand, you know, anyway, this is, this is where you start playing. All right. <laughs> you tell, no, I think I'm going to make some good money on this because I know what you don't know. Is this how we would actually do it? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. But I, I want to open this up to a discussion. I, I think this is a reasonable proposal. Um, but I want to get beyond it's just data driven. Because I think I've said it five times now. I don't believe that. So anyway. Can you just clarify that is determination of the money supply? Yes, no, the increase. Money, money, money growth determination. In order to have price stability, the money, the monetary aggregates, the money in circulation must increase. Otherwise, we, we, we don't, you know, we either have inflation or deflation, depending on which way the GDP goes. Right? I mean, GDP and money for price stability has to be like the GDP goes up, money in circulation has to go up. GDP goes down, money in circulation has to go down. I mean, it's a broad, broad generality. And so therefore, how do we do that? That's the whole point. And I don't see anybody tackling that, so yes. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it's 1.0, you might say. I yeah, think. exactly. Uh, and my, the presentation I'm going to get, I now have to modify in view of what I've learned from you. Uh, oh, well, thank you. I'll take that as, as a compliment. Uh, yes? Who is the expert and who is uh, making that call? Well, that, that's a nice thing. 320 million people. So you're the expert. That's what I'm saying. Do you want to put up $1,000 because cause you think you know what, what this K ought to be? Or even the various factors? No, you think you know what other people think it's Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hey, exactly. That's right, that's right. Because it is a beauty contest. Because the, the, the way you make money is not whether you're correct or not. The way make, you make money is whether you, everybody says the same thing as you. Because the next quarter, we can change it. That's the beauty of it. So let's say we overshoot, and it becomes obvious. You're going, we overshot. And I know everybody else thinks we overshot because I'm reading all the newspaper articles, etc. So. Do you think the crowd psychology could be a problem down the road? Matt, it, 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 it might be for a quarter or two, but not longer than that. Okay. I, I do address this in my last chapters. <laughs> and you have the mic. No mic yet. No, there is right there. Oh, okay. I, I think I, I don't address the idea of using a speculatively money-earning um, mechanism, which could certainly be a part of it, but my concern about it is the underlying values are, they are democratic in the sense that it is a group of people all making a decision jointly, but in terms of a nation, the value is not democratic if the entry into making a decision is a thousand dollar risk because uh, you know you're you are limiting participation to a very wealthy group of people who can afford to do that oh you you can go and you can sell sub shares if, 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 if the price is a thousand dollars somebody else will sell you a, t a hundredth of a share okay? Okay, but then my second point would be that the, an underlying value is speculation, and um, the idea that you need to, you need to, and I understand the research shows that people do respond better to this particular technique when there is a monetary uh, risk and reward. Uh, but I think it's important in having a functioning, long-term democracy to encourage processes 
that, that encourage full participation without that monetary reward. Uh, I mean, I, one of my suggestions is you would include just a line on tax returns where, you know, I say whether it feels like um, the dollar is remaining stable or it's, uh, you know, it, things are more expensive or less expensive, and that part of the bill should be some kind of algorithm or formula that says, okay, maybe, I just, I'm just making this up, I'm not, don't mean any of it, but maybe 30% of the decision is from a predictive model like this, and 20% of the decision comes from a vote of the people on their tax returns or on their ballot that would get them to the um, ballot box. And then we also would include the, the participation and recommendations from the agencies that currently do uh, collect data and um, think they know something. And maybe, you know, they get five, ten percent of the, um, you know, the, of their input goes into that final decision. But instead of relying on one thing, I think it's important to really spread out how that decision is made. The, the problem that they found with prediction markets is that people stop answering what they think is the truth because they know who's going to read the answer. And they start answering in such a way that the reader of the answer will benefit them. And that's exactly what you can't have. Do you follow what I'm saying? So instead of a beauty contest, you now have, you now have an egotistical concept, context. They found that, especially with corporations, uh, on, a, on a national, I don't know, well, nobody's ever test, done a test like this on a, on a national basis. But within corporations, if there is no risk, people read what the reader will read to give the, the person an, answering a benefit. And the whole thing starts falling apart. It's very interesting. Human psychology. The, the huge psychology studies on, on this. I don't mean on what it is that I put together here, but on prediction markets. Because they are ultimately, they're psychological. Um, because yes, there's an economic element to this, that's why I gave you the formula, is to help people give a base case. But the base case isn't the correct answer. And that the, the human psychology becomes the really, really important. So a lot of the uh, prediction market testing that has been done is actually psychological. Well, then I would go back to a point I've made previously in the systems matter. So the kinds of measurements and studies we've done of psychological, the psychology of reactions in people are in our current system. And if they're of corporations, they are in uh, money incentive based systems. So. Um, yeah, but, but you, you hear what I'm saying. People yeah, yeah, then yeah. Ans answer, they do not give the answer that they actually think is correct. They give the answer that will benefit them. Yes, and that is in our ex that's in our existing system. It's being different. So I, all it, I'm saying is that that um, we can only speculate about how people might respond in a completely different money system, which really has a different underlying set of values, and, and we don't we don't know. But the truths of how people respond in these might not hold up in a different monetary system. But in a corporation, you already have a money system that is different. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. Anyway, whatever. Anyway. I, I don't. Anyway. Um, I, I like to play with formula, so I'm, I'm interested in this. And, and I think it was Fisher who came up with the velocity um, part to, to make certain calculations. So I did some calculations for me based on 2014 numbers um, for uh, monetary, you know, what, what we can make on a yearly basis. So based on the 3% uh, growth, a 17 trillion uh, economy, um, and a uh, velocity of, of 1.47 and 1.5, I got that $350 billion. Yeah. That would be for, for the whole year in, in 2014. My question to you is, did you plug in already into your own but, formula? But I did, but the last, and for that year, for 2014 to 2015, I ran, I ran the, the actual hard numbers I had came out dead on. And how much was that? 
Uh, I have to go look at my notes. I yeah, can't remember because I, the other question is that how much would your or did it, your uh, uh, calculation deviate from this? Because this is a simple formula. Yeah, so it's very, it's very, very simple from you. I totally yeah, agree. and it's delta v delta whatever. Yeah, it, it's just three. Um, it's it's very simple. Fair yeah, yeah. I, I was within several percent of the numbers that I was able to get from from Fed statistics again for for 2014 for 2015 because I could get hard numbers for those years. And I thought, hey, so oh my God, this actually works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like to know that that that, that number. Uh, yeah, I, can, I have it I have on my have, computer. Because I want to then compare it with what I have. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I maybe get into the system. Yeah. The other thing that I uh, that that um, stood out for me was I was disappointed. You what? Are you disappointed in that number? Like, oh, darn, only 350 billion? Yeah, right. How much can you do with 350 billion? Yeah, that's no, true. <laughs> well, it'd yeah, be, be a lot bigger today. Yeah, things have really grown. I know. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to say to Virginia that it's always possible that we haven't got it right. And so I, I think that uh, what, what we might be able to agree on is that it's important to get it right. And that it's possible to find out what the answer is by some experimentation. We need to be open to experimenting of different sorts and being ready to accept what the evidence tells us. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just respond to, to two of you on that. So one of the, the nice things about this, because it's repeated every quarter, we can change the rules, as long as the rules are not changed within the quarter. And they're totally publicly, totally available. This quarter, we have changed the following rules. Da, 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 That's the beauty of this. Um, to use that word again. Uh, one more thing I want to say about prediction markets. They have learned that people learn. So if you have a repetitive situation, it gets better and better. Because people say, ah, that's how it works. Ah, I should have done this. So. Yeah, my question is a bit of a follow-up on, on Gorich's question. And, and that is that that's, uh, that's a pretty modest sum in terms of the increment uh, in, in, in spending that uh, you predict. And you read, at least I read the Need Act, and I said, oh, this is going to come up with X trillion next year for putting in infrastructure. Uh, how is this consistent with uh, with this very modest kind of yeah, suggestion? Yeah. And the, if you look, read the Icelandic uh, yes. report, also a very modest number comes out of that. Make the appropriate uh, growth rate. So how is this consistent with the aspiration of the Need Act for this big stimulus that's going to increase jobs by X number of million? Well, the Need the Need Act, which I've not read for the last couple of years, is over five years, if I remember correctly. Uh, right, their whole predictions are so you have to take all their numbers and divide them by five to begin with. Right. right. So uh, that that right there is a huge, huge factor. So then we're definitely in the trillions here. And the the other thing is that once you replace all bank loans with a government money, uh, that provides the opportunity for. Uh, a large part of the stimulus. It's not the annual growth, it's right. the change of it. Yeah. All right, thank you. The I think we get thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. That's part of the stuff there.